Iowa's farm sector confronting challenges ranging from the bird flu to inflation. We sit down to discuss with Iowa's Secretary of Agriculture, Mike Neg, on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, April 1st edition of Iowa Press. Here is Kay Henderson. As we sit down to record this edition of Iowa Press, sadly more than 10 million chickens and ducks and geese and turkeys in Iowa have been euthanized because bird flu is here again. Our guest today leads an agency that helps con detect, confirm, and deal with the aftermath. Mike Neg, Iowa Secretary of Agriculture, welcome back to Iowa Press. Good to be back and congratulations to you. I haven't had a chance to say that since wow. you've officially been in the chair. Thank you, appreciate it. Amen. Also joining our conversation today are Clay Masters of Iowa Public Radio and Aaron Murphy of the Gazette in Cedar Rapids. So Secretary Nag, wanted to give you an opportunity first to just kind of set the scene for us. Kate talked about it a little bit, but what's the scope of what's going on right now? What's the latest? Yeah, unfortunately we are dealing with high path avian influenza in the state of Iowa again, and, and we last dealt with this in, in 2015. Uh, which still ranks as the, the largest animal disease outbreak in U.S. history, uh, occurred then, and about half of that event was in the state of Iowa. So we have a lot of experience dealing with this. We started to watch what was happening on the East Coast uh, uh, as it worked its way through the beginning of this year, and it keeps kept moving to the Midwest, and now we do have bird flu in the, in the Midwest in the Mississippi Flyway. And I get asked a lot about how does this compare to last, uh, to last time, there's a pretty distinct difference this time in that we have a lot of wild bird introductions where wild birds are carrying the virus, they're interacting with the domestic bird population and we end up with positives. Whereas in 15, we had a lot more uh, situations where it was spreading from site to site or from farm to farm. So that's a pretty distinct difference between the two. That seems like it would be more difficult to control for that reason, right? It is. It tells you a couple things. You know, we're, we learned a lot uh, coming out of 15 about what should the state of Iowa do? How do we need to increase our capacity to respond? USDA learned a lot. Uh, producers learned a lot about biosecurity. How do you protect your site? And, uh, and, and then just uh, generally, how do we respond? And so I think a, a large part of why we're not seeing that lateral movement farm to farm is because we've done a better job of acting quickly to contain the virus where it is and that farms have implemented better biosecurity to, to protect their farms from movement. Now time will tell uh, how this plays out, but I would also note that uh, you know, we didn't start the 15 outbreak until the middle of April and uh, we're, already, we're already a month in this time around. Well, it does, definitely does feel like deja vu uh, to 2015. Uh, I do morning newscasts and I'm regularly updating about how many mm -hmm. backyard flocks or commercial production uh, facilities. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to know, you, you said that you've learned a lot from, from last time. Buena Vista County has had a lot of these cases. Yeah. Uh, can you kind of hone in on, on how to help a county that is obviously having it spread? Right, so in the state of Iowa today, we've got 12 confirmed cases. Two of those are backyard, 10 are commercial, and, and we, we expect and, and should expect that there will, there's going to be additional uh, sites that, that, that we see go positive. But right now in BV County, we've got four cases, and a couple of those are turkey, and a couple, uh, one of those is a large egg layer. You know, again, what, what we focus on, and, and these are well-established protocols together with the USDA, with the Iowa Department of Agriculture, what you want to do is try to detect early, 
confine, contain that site, quarantine that site, and then depopulate and dispose of those birds as quickly as you can because that is the best way to prevent spread to other farms is to keep it contained on a, on a site. So that continues to be, I mean, we would say that around any site, but especially in an area where you've got a lot of activity. And of course, then we're looking at, are, are there connections between any of these farms? There's no evidence of that at this point. And as far as people watching this at home, you know, a lot of people focused on grocery prices. Mm -hmm. uh, any idea what this is gonna do to people uh, when they go to buy eggs or, or, or meat at the store? You know, the, uh, the, the fact is that you're, well, we're seeing food price inflation anyway for a lot of reasons, but uh, it is true that if we continue to see the spread of, of high path and, and uh, affecting more and more sites that yes, I think you could very well see a, a change in price and even availability. Now, the good news about the poultry industry is they can restock quickly, they can rebuild populations, but uh, yeah, I think, we're, I think we will see uh, some, some increases in prices as we go through the spring. And then it really just depends on uh, what kind of spread do we see over the next few months. Again, think of it, we got, we've got wild birds that are carrying the virus. They don't, they don't succumb to it, but they can carry it. And uh, where are we in the, in the scheme of things in terms of uh, migration of birds, right? We've got a couple of months yet to go. So that's, that's what, why we've gotta be acting quickly to contain it where it is. Kay mentioned that more than 10 million birds have had to be euthanized so far. Yeah. Uh, for, for the average layperson, that may sound like a huge number. It is yeah. a huge number. But to kind of help the scope, that's only a small fraction of the birds in production in Iowa, right? I think it, you know, yeah, this is the time to, be, to re be reminded that we're number one in egg production. We have nearly 60 million laying hens in the state of Iowa. Uh, we're number seven in turkey production, and we have a lot of broiler production along the western uh, side of the state of Iowa. So we have a lot of birds, and we have a lot of uh, bird facilities and barns. We also have a lot of folks, and especially over the last couple of years, have gotten into the birds in their backyard. And so we have a lot of birds in the state of Iowa, is what I'm saying. And so, yes, to, to know that we've got 12 sites today, actually the number's now approaching closer to 13 million birds that have had to be euthanized, and, uh, but that is only a percent of, of what we have in the state of Iowa. And the reason I ask it, it kind of gets to what Clay was talking about is, are we at a point yet where we're worried about the supply chain and the impact that that might have? Well, you know, uh, yes, in, the, in that, we, we, as we look ahead, you say, this is why we've got to contain, and it's not just in Iowa, but, you know, we've got 23 states in the country currently that are dealing with confirmed cases. And so this isn't just an Iowa issue. This is a, a, a U.S. issue. And, and again, you look at those, those different categories, broilers, turkeys, egg production. Um, the fact is we're seeing less supply because of the virus and that that will result in uh, we believe some prices going up especially in a time of year where coming up to easter there's a lot of folks looking for eggs and and so that could create some price pressure um let's switch to the swine industry yeah. african swine fever has been detected in the western hemisphere for the first time in 40 years i think right. last fall what can you tell uh swine producers about what the situation is and what they need to do you know this so generally we'd say foreign animal diseases there's a we deal with uh, disease in livestock production all the time but a foreign animal disease is a specific diseases that have trade implications uh, that uh, that result in uh, you know countries restricting movement from uh, in in trade and and exports and so that's why they're different so african swine fever high path ai and foot and mouth disease would be examples of that uh, we've been watching ASF really developed uh, starting back in 18 and 19 in China, then it moved into Eastern Europe, and then, yes, for the first time since 1980, we've got it in the Western Hemisphere in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. So it's, it's always a threat, but when you've got it in your backyard, it feels like the risk is higher, right? So we've been focused just like we have on planning around high path, how do we effectively respond? There's been a lot of work being done. We've been exercising plans and trying to find gaps in our response. Uh, the, what's the message to our pork producers? Um, we need to work hard to contain it where it is, so support uh, the Dominican government and the Haitian government in trying to stamp this out, keep it out of the United States by monitoring our borders, keep it out of your farm is the next layer of defense, and then effect, effectively respond if you have to. And we've got planning going on on all those, those stages. Um, so uh, the, the, the other is biosecurity, right? Do what you can on your farm to take care of your animals. That's what we need folks to be doing. So what about 
big expos where people gather and they look at large groups of animals. Yeah. Well, so on the bird side of things, right. we have had to, we've taken the step to prohibit live bird exhibitions for the time being. Now, I'm still hopeful, and again, time will tell. How does this all play out? Uh, maybe we're approaching the end. Maybe we're just getting started. Uh, time will tell. But what we've done is we've said we, we, we won't allow a live bird exhibition until 30 days have passed since our last confirmed case. We'll start, we'll restart the 30 day clock every time we have a confirmed positive. I'm still hopeful that we could have poultry shows at our county fairs and the state fair. Time will tell. In terms of large gathering of gatherings of people, I, I think uh, a world, no, I mean about the world, pork a world expo. pork expo yeah. it absolutely can go on. Uh, there's no live uh, uh, animal exhibition anymore uh, associated with that. It's really just people uh, coming from around the world, and I think that's a great thing. And we need to get back to doing those things. So shifting gears a little bit, the U.S. Supreme Court recently announced that it will hear the pork industry's lawsuit uh, regarding a California law and, and uh, the, the caging and confinement of animals in production. Is that something that your office is watching with interest? Absolutely. Uh, this is good news. Uh, you know, it, look, uh, uh, these are exactly the types of cases that a Supreme Court should take. These are, these are issues between the states, and our founding fathers even envisioned that those things would happen. And, uh, and that the Supreme Court is the right place for that. So when you're talking Prop 12, uh, yes, we've got concerns about that. And, and you know, think of it from this perspective, you know, activists drove that effort in California, picked arbitrary standards for production, and then are trying to apply those to uh, other, other states. Now, voters of California can tell Al California agriculture whatever they want and, and hold them to whatever standards they want, but they can't do that outside of their borders. There's a, there's a constitutional issue there. And so I think it's right that the Supreme Court will, will look at that. I'm hopeful that we'll see a positive outcome there. One thing that has happened this week with Iowa farmers was there was a gathering of uh, more than 100 that came to the state capitol rotunda this week uh, concerned about the carbon capture mm. pipelines that have been proposed in the state by three companies. Uh, talked with a few landowners, heard some of them speak, and they're very concerned about eminent domain, the, the government seizing their land uh, if it's in the public's interest. Um, the legislature has done something to kind of extend that until well, it, it's moving forward uh, mm -hmm. that could keep eminent domain from taking place until early next year. But what kind of thoughts do you have for, uh, for these landowners who say we can't get anybody to listen to us that we do not want to turn this land over? Yeah, the, the, these are tough. These are tough issues, right? So I, I see this particularly around the carbon capture and sequestration uh, challenge or issue. You know, so you say uh, on on one. On one hand, I can see the benefits of capturing carbon, especially as it relates to renewable energy and ethanol plants. If you can lower the carbon intensity score a couple ways, you can lower the carbon intensity of the corn that's being processed at that plant, and then if you can capture the CO2, you can lower the carbon intensity of a gallon of ethanol. And, and what that can do is, we hope, preserve the, uh, the longevity and the, uh, the uh, ethanol and biodiesel and renewable energy in our energy portfolio as a country. And that's, that's good news. That's a positive thing that can happen. On the flip side, if there's the issue of building a pipeline, and those can be very difficult decisions for a landowner. Imagine a pipeline coming across a century farm, right? So what I've encouraged uh, each of the pipeline companies to do is negotiate in good faith, compensate landowners fairly, answer their questions, satisfy their concerns, that that is the way that if these projects are going to go, they should go because uh, because the landowners are willing to to participate. Have you met with any landowners about it that oh, are concerned about it on their property? Yes, I, I do. I, I hear from folks as I travel the state and, you know, folks on all sides of this, right? I mean, I've got, I've got people involved in uh, farmers who sell grain to ethanol plants and see the value of that. And I, I absolutely hear from uh, producers who are working through this this challenge of what is fair compensation? Am I getting, you know, what about my tile lines and those types of things? So I do hear from folks all the time. So it. should eminent domain be used in this kind of situation? Do you believe it in here? Well, I think we have to be, we should be careful, right? There needs to, we should be careful in using eminent domain. There has to be balance, right? The, the idea is that you're going to preserve that, the use of that tool uh, when there's an economic imperative to do so, and yet you have to balance uh, private property rights with that. So again, I, I, I would much rather see these, these pipelines go because there's been uh, deals that have been done and, and landowners have been satisfied. At the same time, uh, cars have become more fuel efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, people have been, uh, ethanol consumption in America has kind of leveled off recently. 
How necessary do you think these pipelines are right now? Well, I, first of all, I think on uh, on ethanol in particular, what's happening with energy in this country right now, and uh, families know what the, pri what the price of fuel means to their bottom line, and we've all seen what's happened uh, from that standpoint. And so wouldn't now be a great time for us to be looking at more domestic renewable energy production? Uh, instead, we're, we're trying to figure, we're releasing oil from the uh, the uh, reserve. We're trying to potentially go and buy from other places, and then we're going to open up. I saw the Biden administration is they're obsessed with EVs. You know, they're, now we're going to open up uh, mining for the minerals that we need to uh, produce batteries. Hey, let's look at all of this. Let's also recognize that today, ethanol and biodiesel are delivering something to the marketplace that has value. Uh, for goodness sake, let's get to year-round access to E15 and try to take some pressure off of uh, what's what's affecting our families. You mentioned E15. Mm -hmm. Governor Reynolds has asked the legislature to essentially pass an E15 mandate. Is that a good idea? Uh, we should definitely offer more choices to consumers. So, uh, yes, it would be great if there was a standard uh, that said that, that fuel marketers should offer these higher blends to consumers. The, the bill that the governor proposed, I've said all along, is a very, very practical bill in that it recognizes that uh, there are fueling stations out there that that don't have compatible equipment. It, it's an older station. It's a, a mom and pop shop that there is no earthly reason for them to break up their concrete and replace all their tanks and pumps and hoses to, uh, to be able to offer these higher blends. But for those stations that can and that have compatible infrastructure, let's get on with offering those higher blends. State of Iowa over the last dozen years or better has invested through our department $50 million in cost share for fuel marketers to put these, this type of infrastructure in. Let's use that. Let's, let's get these higher blends in the hands of consumers, in the tanks, sorry, of our, our consumers' vehicles. The proposal sort of puts you in the same position as the Federal Environmental Protection Agency in that you're going to grant the waivers, and it says you shall grant the waivers. Are you prepared to do that? Uh, we are. Uh, what I want, what I've asked the legislature is make sure you're very clear about what you'd like that waiver process to be. I don't want a lot of gray area here. But look, again, this goes back to, and we should always recognize this, we can have a great industry that produces a fantastic product that's cheaper and better for the environment. But if a consumer doesn't have the opportunity to pick up the pump handle and pump it into their gas tank, we haven't completed the supply chain. And yet it is absolutely true that there's infrastructure out there that's not compatible with higher blends. Let's make sure that we understand that and we're able to have a, a effective waiver process. Just one Final question, when we're talking about waivers, this is for the, the small entrepren mm -hmm. entrepreneur has a small station. Do you know how many of those there may be in Iowa? I, I don't. I mean, we've, got, we've been working with the, the Department of Natural Resources to look at, you know, what are the age of tanks and those types of things. I mean, that, that's something we will have to then work through. As, but but my, what I envision is that we will have some very clear lines of this equipment is compatible, this is not based on age or based on the type of equipment or the brand of equipment. I think this can be done. But again, I think the legislature should... Uh, should tell us exactly what they want that waiver process to look like, and then we'll absolutely uh, deliver on it. So staying under the Golden Dome up there in the Capitol, uh, legislators are, for the first time in a while, um, advancing legislation regarding the state's natural resources and outdoor uh, trust fund. Now that legislation may not make it all the way this year, but it's, it's reignited that debate over how to get money into mm -hmm. that system, and more specifically, I wanted to ask you about what to do that with that money once it's in there, yeah. and there's, there's a formula in place, but when the legislation comes up, sometimes there's proposals to change that formula. What, what would you advocate for? What, what would you like to see that money you know, go towards if, if, if lawmakers manage to get money into that trust fund? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't. I know this is being debated, and that's good, right? I think I've said many times at this table that uh, us having, as a state, an ongoing conversation around how we're going to fund water quality work over the long run. Do we have dedicated, long-term funding? And we do today. We've worked hard over the last couple of sessions to extend that funding formula out many years, and so the work has begun, more than begun. We've we're, we're several years into trying to identify how do we ramp up, how do we scale up, how do we expand our capacity to deliver technical assistance and financial assistance to landowners and to cities and, and to work not just in the non-point side of things, right, the, the ag landscape or the non-point part of urban areas, but also around point sources, water quality, uh, uh, drinking water and wastewater facilities as well. That, that's the whole piece that we need to be looking at. And so 
whatever we look at, whatever the formula, whatever the funding source is, the outgoing formula needs to continue to take those types of things into account. So that's what we've been focused on the last several years is regardless of the funding source, are the dollars being deployed in a way that we're attracting partnerships and getting work done? But again, recognizing that ag, urban, point source, non-point all together is what we've got to be moving if we're going to see the change that we want to see. Next year, it's coming up on 10 years since mm -hmm. the nutrient reduction strategy was passed, which is a, a, not really passed, but recommended, you know, voluntary actions that farmers can take to help uh, with any kind of pollutants that might come off their field. 45% reduction of nitrogen phosphorus. Mm -hmm. uh, last year when you were on this program, you were excited about what you saw as progress that's been, make, been made. How do you view what's happened over the last year since you were here? Well, absolutely. So we're coming up on 10 years. And remember, too, it's not just the ag piece. I think that's something that makes us different, and, and it's important to note this as a state, is that we looked at all of the practices. We have a, this is something that the Department of Natural Resources, the Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship work on together. We've got point and non-point, urban and rural. We never wanted to be in a situation where the farm community could point and say it's all them, or everybody else could point and say it's all ag. We've got to have a holistic approach to this. So I, I think at that time I told you that we've made great progress on phosphorus. Phosphorus tends to stick with the soil. If you're preventing soil erosion, you're, you're uh, you know, preventing the loss of phosphorus. Nitrogen tends to travel with water. That's where we've had to implement new practices that came with the strategy. Wetlands and bioreactors and saturated buffers and cover crops, those are the things that we need to really double down on on, on uh, nitrogen. So what have we done in the last year? Uh, a couple things I'm really proud of is new partnerships that we've launched. Uh, we just did uh, a project with, uh, announced a project with Polk County and Des Moines Waterworks to get cover crops seeded uh, on the ground in this area. I, I think that's a great example of we will literally work with anybody who wants to in good faith get stuff done on the ground. Cedar Rapids, Ames, uh, those are the types of projects that we've got uh, going across the state today. Last fall I was up in Calhoun County speaking with a farmer who was showing me some of the practices that he's put in mm -hmm. close to the Raccoon River, pretty innovative stuff. I was asking him wh why isn't there more buy-in in the area and he said a lot of it has to do with barriers to getting funding to put in wetlands and, and unique kind of ways to, to help with water quality mm -hmm. and also just uh, people don't see the long, don't want to invest in the long-term effect there and, and he said you know I don't want to be regulated to do this, but maybe it's time. I mean, how do you get the conversation to continue going so more people get buy-in? Well, first of all, it's particularly up in Calhoun County, there's some great things going on with how are we linking uh, wetlands with irrigation as a possibility. You know, uh, being able to put a couple of inches of irrigated water on uh, a crop in, in July uh, in a dry year could make a huge difference and could uh, have a significant impact on a farmer's bottom line, right? So now you're starting to talk about, let's layer these together. We get a nutrient reduction. We potentially have an opportunity for irrigation. We have habitat that Pheasants Forever and Ducks Unlimited are interested in around the wetland. Uh, that's, that's the type of thing that we need to show people, frankly, uh, 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 get more farmers on those sites, have more field days, those types of things. Uh, look, this is about uh, talking about these things in terms of a return on the investment, a return on the investment for the, all the partners involved, and uh, I, I, we can do that. It does take some time, though, to find those sites, talk to the landowners, and then get those built. So uh, we're, we're well on our way to uh, changing the, the whole dynamic, especially on wetlands, because of how we're approaching that and the pace that we're building them. Mr. Secretary, you'll be running for re-election later this year. Uh, your opponent, uh, Democrat John Norwood, we suspect may bring up issues around water quality um, and, and challenge you. Uh, how do you plan to address those issues when you're talking to voters about yeah. what you have done and, and whether it's been sufficient to address the needs of, of improving Iowa's water quality. Well, I welcome that conversation because uh, uh, I, I, am, I am incredibly proud of the work that's getting done across the state. Look, even in a disrupted time, the last couple of years, I can say to you that we have set records in terms of conservation adoption in the state of Iowa. Uh, and that's because of the focus that we brought to it, the resources, the partnerships. There has never been as much awareness uh, and, and, and resources being dedicated to improving water quality in the state of Iowa as we have today. And that's saying a lot. Uh, we've got a long history of conservation in this state. Now, how are we turning the page and saying, let's go to the next level? 
let's accelerate. We've got two million acres of cover crops. How do we get to four? How do we get to six? Those are the types of things that we get to talk about now because of the foundation. The work that we've done over the last several years allows us to say, now, how do we go to the next level? I'm proud of the partnerships and more than anything, I'm proud of the, uh, all of the boots on the ground, the people who go to work every day to do real work on water quality. And of course, all the farmers and the cities and everybody who says, yes, we're gonna do something. And there's a lot to be proud of there. Half a minute left. The U.S. drought monitor this week shows mm -hmm. about two thirds of Iowa is very dry. Yeah. I was very dry last year and then we had a bumper crop. Is this anything to worry about? Oh, it's, it's worth worrying about, but you know, okay, we will lose this crop three or four times this year, as the saying goes. You know, we're always a couple weeks out from something uh, going wrong with the crop. Uh, a third of the state's got D1 to D2 drought, a third of it's got abnormally dry, and that is concerning because we're still working off of significant rain deficits. Soil moisture is better than we were last year, so uh, we're sitting okay. We need rain to fall. Well, we are done with this conversation today. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Iowa Press. Thank you. You can watch every episode on iowapbs.org, or you can watch us at our regular broadcast time, 7.30 on Friday or noon on Sunday. For everyone here at Iowa PBS, thanks for watching. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.